I want to give a special thanks to Vikings War of Clans for sponsoring this video. The Vikings development team asked me to try out the game, which is totally free to download, and I was hooked after just 5 minutes. Vikings has this cool old school strategy RPG feel because it's inspired by some amazing games we played in the 90s and early 2000s like Civilization and Red Alert. In the game you train your Vikings, build up your army and village, and then you can fight against other players. The game is incredibly versatile, so you can choose your gameplay. Diplomacy and teamwork's your thing? Go for it. You want to attack and destroy cities? Have at it. There are a lot of ways to win, so take control and do it the way you want to. So please help support my channel by downloading Vikings for free only from my links in the description box and get a special bonus of 200 gold coins and a protective shield that will be extremely useful for the start. Don't forget to look me up and join my Vikings clan under my nickname, Criminally Listed. So please download Vikings War of Clans today and I hope to see you in the game soon. Number 3, Jodine Saren. In our August 2018 video, Three Haunting Unsolved Cases of People Who Are Murdered in Bed, we looked at the unsolved 2007 murder of Jodine Sarin, who lived in Carlsbad, California. In 2007, Jodine was 39 years old. Jodine had schizophrenia, but she lived a full and active life. She loved making floral arrangements and she achieved a certificate in floral arrangement. Jodine was also active in her community. She volunteered at the Humane Society and at her church. She also took the time to help seniors who were homebound. For 10 years, Jodine had been living alone in her condo, which was a short distance from her parents' home. Because of her mental illness, her family stopped by daily to give her assistance. On Valentine's Day 2007, Jodine's parents, Arden Lois Sarin, called her several times throughout the day, but Jodine didn't answer the phone. At around 10 o'clock that evening, they drove over to her condo. They had their own set of keys and they unlocked the front door. But when they opened the door, they were surprised to find that the chain lock was on the door. Art kicked the door, it broke the chain lock. Art went directly to his 39 year old daughter's bedroom. In the bedroom, there was yet another surprise for Art. Jodine was in bed, and there was a man on top of her. Art was immediately embarrassed because he thought that they were having sex. But Art was also concerned that the man may have been taking advantage of his daughter. So Art told the man to get dressed. Then Art and Lois went out to the living room to wait for Jodine and the man. They were expecting that Jodine and her friend would come out of the bedroom and she would introduce him to them. They waited for a few minutes but neither Jodine nor the man came into the living room. Art decided to go check on them. When he got into the bedroom, he saw that the man was gone and Jodine was lying on the bed naked. Art realized that the man avoided the living room where he and Lois had been waiting and he slipped out the front door. Art touched Jodine's body and he was shocked at how cold her body was. 911 was called and the police and paramedics arrived minutes later. But it was way too late to do anything for Jodine. She had been dead for hours. The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head and strangulation. The police speculated that Jodine may have known her killer. She was a trusting and naive woman, and there were no signs of a break-in or forced entry, so it's thought that she let the killer into her home. Also, it appeared that the killer felt comfortable enough to stay in the condo hours after the murder. The police collected male DNA and compared it to the DNA of male acquaintances of Jodine's, but no match was found. 
The DNA was also entered into the FBI's Combined DNA Index System, also known as CODIS. But again, no match was found. In 2017, the police had a composite image of the killer developed from his DNA. But the image did not develop any new leads. At Parabon Nano Labs, he was famous for identifying Joseph James D'Angelo as the Golden State Killer, did a reverse genealogy search. They found relatives of the killer. Then they filled out the relative's family tree that led them to a man named David Mabrito. Mabrito was born on January 20th, 1969 in San Antonio, Texas. He had been a transient, but he had settled in Oceanside, California, which is about three miles from Carlsbad. Mabrito had been married, and he had a son. Mabrito had no significant run-ins with the law. At the time of Jodine's murder, he would have been 38 years old. However, by the time his DNA was matched to the DNA left at the crime scene, it was too late to serve justice. Mabrito had died by suicide eight years earlier in January 2011. He was 42 years old when he died. He killed himself two weeks shy of the fourth anniversary of Jodine's murder. Mabrito's son voluntarily gave a sample of his DNA. Using his DNA, investigators confirmed that Mabrito killed Jodine. The police said that there is no evidence that Jodine and Mabrito knew each other. They do not know why he chose her as his victim and they do not know why he decided to kill her. Jodine's family is happy that the killer was identified and they are grateful for whatever closure that may give them, but they know nothing will ever bring Jodine back. Number 2. Renee Sweeney In March 2017, our video, Five Terrifying Unsolved Cases of Stalking, featured the unsolved murder of 23-year-old Renee Sweeney. In the winter of 1998, Sweeney was a university student who lived in Sudbury, which is a city in northern Ontario, Canada. On the morning of Tuesday, January 27, 1998, Sweeney was working at the Adults Only Video Store, which was located on one of the main streets in Sudbury. At 11.27 a.m., a man who was described as young, white, with blonde hair and wearing glasses, walked into the store. Renee was standing in front of the desk and the young man started stabbing her. He then went to the washroom where he presumably washed some of the blood off himself. He came back out and he noticed that Renee was no longer in front of the desk. She had crawled behind the desk where there was a telephone. The young man went behind the desk and continued to stab Sweeney. Three minutes after he entered the store, two of Sweeney's friends came into the store to visit her. The young man pushed past them and walked out of the store. Sweeney's friends were horrified by what they found. Sweeney was bleeding to death. She had been stabbed at least 30 times. Sweeney's friends called 911 and Sweeney was taken to the hospital. But sadly, she died as a result of her wounds. The police checked the store and $200 had been stolen. However, the police did not think that the motive for the murder was robbery. Instead, they think she was stalked and targeted. In the two weeks before Sweeney was killed, she had received several phone calls on her home phone from someone who would hang up as soon as she answered. Her co-workers also noticed unusual behavior from her shortly before her murder. Usually, Sweeney would park in the spot farthest from the store. 
but in the days before the murder, she would park in the spot closest to the entrance of the store. The police had plenty of evidence. Notably, they got a description of the killer from Sweeney's friends, which resulted in this sketch. Also, not far from the crime scene, a police dog found a pair of white gardening gloves and a windbreaker. They were all splattered with blood. The jacket was unusual. It was a High Sierra windbreaker and it had only been sold at Mervyn's department stores in California between 1994 and 1995. In the left breast pocket of the jacket was a diaper pin. Finally, the police had the killer's fingerprints and DNA. Shortly after the murder, a man was arrested, but the police released him when none of the evidence connected him to the crime scene. The police did not make another arrest in the weeks, months, or even years after the murder. The police received over 2,000 tips, and they cleared 1,500 suspects. In January 2017, 19 years after the murder, the police released a composite sketch that was developed by Parabon Nanolabs using the killer's DNA. The photo generated hundreds of tips, but unfortunately, it did not lead to an arrest. Then in November 2018, the police got a major break in the case. They found a person of interest named Robert Stephen Wright. Wright was 39 years old and he lived in North Bay, Ontario, which is about 80 miles from Sudbury. He worked as an emergency room lab tech at the North Bay Regional Health Center. He was not married and he did not have any children. In January 1998, when Sweeney was murdered, Wright was 18 years old, he lived in Sudbury. In fact, Wright attended high school about half a mile from the crime scene. The police did not say how Wright became a person of interest and there is currently a publication ban on the case. That means none of the evidence that led to Wright's arrest can be made public before the trial. Wright did not have a criminal record and he had no major run-ins with the police. People who went to high school with Wright said that he was quiet, introverted, and shy. In a senior poll, Wright was voted quietest student. Before November 2018, the police in Sudbury had no idea who Wright was. But when he became a person of interest, the police trailed him and they picked up an object he discarded that had his DNA on it. His DNA was then compared to the DNA that was left at the crime scene. It was a match. On December 11, 2018, nearly 21 years after 23-year-old Renee Sweeney was stabbed to death, Wright was arrested. He was charged with first-degree murder. Wright applied for bail but the judge decided that he should stay in jail until his trial. At the time of this video, a trial date has yet to be set. Number 1. Angie Houseman. In our most viewed video, Three Haunting Deathbed Confessions, we cover the brutal murder of 9-year-old Angie Houseman. On November 18th, 1993, Angie attended school. At the end of the school day, she took the bus to her neighborhood, which was in St. Anne, Missouri. She got off the bus about half a block from her home. But sadly, she never made it home. Nine days later, hunters found her nude body bound to a tree in St. Charles County, Missouri. She had duct tape over her eyes and her wrists were handcuffed behind her back. Although she had been missing for nine days, she had been alive just hours before her body was found. She had died from exposure. 
She had been sexually assaulted and tortured during the day she was held captive. The kidnapping and murder were incredibly shocking to the people of St. Anne. But unfortunately, no arrests were made in the weeks after the murder and the case went cold. Then in September 1996, nearly three years after the murder, a new possible lead emerged. A man named Brian Squires was dying in a hospital in St. Louis, Missouri from complications from AIDS. On his deathbed, he told several nurses he had committed some horrible crimes. He said that he and another man kidnapped Angie Houseman and tied her to a tree. He did not identify his accomplice. Squires also confessed to taking part in the kidnapping and murder of 13-year-old Gina Brooks, who lived in Fredericktown, Missouri. On the night of August 5, 1989, Gina left her family's home to go for a bike ride. She did not return home, and her bike was found abandoned a few blocks from her house. On the night Gina went missing, witnesses saw her talking to a man who was driving a station wagon. The witnesses also said that there was at least one other man in the station wagon. Not long after she was seen talking to the driver, people in the area heard a young woman screaming for help. Everyone assumes that this was Gina screaming for help. Sadly, Gina's remains have never been found. Squires told the nurses that he and two friends, Nathan Danny Williams and Timothy Ballou, kidnapped and killed Gina. Squires also told the nurses that Williams had committed another murder on his own. Squires said that in March 1975, when Williams was 14 years old, he stabbed 23-year-old Laura Dinwiddie to death in her apartment in St. Louis, Missouri. On September 18, 1996, not long after making the deathbed confessions, Brian Squires, who was 37, passed away. The nurses were horrified by what Squires told them. They thought his stories were too horrible to be true, so at first, they didn't go to the police. But then they decided that it was best to tell the police. The police then looked into Brian Squires, Nathan Williams, and Timothy Ballou's backgrounds. They all had criminal records, which included sex crimes. The police questioned Ballou, and he said that Gina Brooks' body was buried on his father's property. Searches of the property were conducted, but no human remains were found. When the investigators told Ballou that nothing was found on his father's property, he admitted that he had lied about knowing the location of Gina's body. When Brian Squires made the deathbed confession, Nathan Williams was in prison serving a 30-year term for sexually assaulting a 10-year-old girl. He was arrested in September 1989, a month after Gina Brooks disappeared. Even before Squire's death by confession, Williams had been a person of interest in the murder of Laura Dinwiddie. Williams first caught the attention of the police in 1978, about three years after the murder. Williams, who was 18 at the time, told a bartender that his friend had killed Dinwiddie and the bartender went to the police. Williams' friend was never identified, but he was arrested for the murder. But those charges were dropped a month later because the grand jury did not indict him. The grand jury did not think that the district attorney had enough evidence. Nearly two decades went by, and then in 1996, months before Squires made his deathbed confessions, a detective questioned Williams about Dinwiddie's murder. Williams had a different story this time. Williams told the detective he was there when the murder happened, but he said he wasn't the one who committed the murder. 
Williams said that his friend and his friend's brother were the ones who killed Dinwiddie. The friend he accused of being the killer was the same young man who was charged with Dinwiddie's murder in 1978. The detective interviewed the friend and he denied committing the murder. He voluntarily took a polygraph exam and it was determined that he was telling the truth. His brother was also asked if he was involved in the murder and he adamantly denied being involved. Detectives also tried to interview Nathan Williams regarding Gina's murder, but he refused to answer any questions. In 1999, three years after Brian Squire's deathbed confessions, Timothy Ballou and Nathan Williams were charged with the murder of Gina Brooks. But then, several months later, the charges against Ballou were dropped. Instead, he was charged with lying to investigators about where Gina's remains were located, and he was sentenced to 30 months in jail. In 2003, the murder charges against Williams were dropped as well. The district attorney said that the charges were dropped because of a lack of evidence. The police are convinced that Williams, Blue, and Squires were involved in the murder of Gina Brooks, but until they find evidence that definitively connects them to the murder, Williams and Blue won't be charged again. The police also believe that Williams killed Laura Dinwiddie. But just like with the murder of Gina Brooks, he won't be charged unless some physical evidence is found that connects him to the crime. Williams will be able to apply for parole in 2039. He'll be 79 years old. The police and Gina Brooks' family are still hoping that one day her remains will be found. So it's believed that Brian Squires was telling the truth about the murders of Gina Brooks and Laura Dinwiddie in his deathbed confessions. But was he telling the truth about the third murder, the 1993 murder of Angie Houseman? Squires told the nurses that he had worked with an accomplice, but there was no way that Nathan Williams was his accomplice. Williams had been arrested in 1989, and he was four years into a 30-year sentence at the time of Angie's murder. If Squires was telling the truth, who was his accomplice? The police investigated acquaintances of Squires, but they did not come up with any suspects. So for over a decade, the case remained cold. Then, in early 2018, the police had the evidence from Angie's crime scene re-examined for DNA. On her underwear, investigators found a small trace of male DNA. The DNA was then entered into CODIS and a match was found. The DNA belonged to 61-year-old Earl Cox. Cox had a disturbing criminal record. In the early 1980s, Cox was serving in the Air Force as a computer operator and he was stationed in Germany. In 1982, he was convicted of sexually abusing four young girls he babysat. He was dishonorably discharged and he was sentenced to eight years in prison. He served five years in the United States Penitentiary Leavenworth in Kansas, and then he was paroled. Cox then moved to St. Louis. In 1989 and 1991, he was questioned about sexually abusing children. He never went to court over the allegations, but in 1991, his parole was revoked. He was sent back to Leavenworth and he spent a year there. He was released in December 1992, about 11 months before Angie was kidnapped and murdered. Cox, who was 36 years old at the time of the murder, lived in Ferguson, Missouri, which is less than 8 miles from St. Anne, Missouri. Cox had family who lived in St. Anne. In fact, his sister lived three houses away from Angie's school and her house was within a mile of Angie's bus stop. 
When the police were investigating Angie's kidnapping and murder, they had a list of sex offenders in the area, and Cox was on the list. But he was never interviewed. Sometime in the late 1990s or early 2000s, Cox moved to Colorado Springs, Colorado. In 2003, he was sending emails of money to what he thought was a 14-year-old girl living in Virginia. He wanted her to come stay with him and be his sex slave. It turned out that he was really talking to an undercover federal agent. Cox was arrested and his computer was examined. It turned out that Cox had been running a massive child pornography ring called the Brotherhood. He was convicted for his crimes and he was sentenced to 10 years of prison. He was supposed to be released in 2011. But then, two months before he was supposed to be released, a judge ruled that he was a sexually dangerous person. This allowed the government to keep him in prison indefinitely. When his DNA was matched to the DNA that was left on Angie's underwear, he was incarcerated in a medium security prison in North Carolina. In June 2019, Earl Cox was charged with the first degree murder of Angie Houseman. When the police announced that Cox was charged with murder, they said he wasn't the only suspect and he may not have worked alone. They said that during Angie's nine days of captivity, she was moved to different locations. They think that this suggests that other people were involved. The police said that more arrests may be coming. But notably, they did not mention if they thought that Brian Squires was involved in the kidnapping and murder. But people pointed out that Squires seemed to be telling the truth about the other two murders he talked about in his deathbed confessions. Squires said that he worked with an accomplice in the kidnapping and murder of Angie Houseman. His brother was also asked if he was involved in the murder and he adamantly denied being involved. So was Squires telling the truth in his deathbed confession when he talked about Angie Houseman's murder? Or did Earl Cox have some other accomplices? In the coming months, the family of Angie Houseman are hoping that all these questions will be answered. But for now, they are happy that after nearly 26 years, at least one of the men has been charged with her murder. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please go to criminalist.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about exclusive podcasts. But that is all for today. Thanks again for watching.